right, so I'm going to jump right into an interview. I have now spent a couple of days with you. Uh, Raji, it's ni nice to have met you and to get to know you and your team over the last couple of days here in Likewise, Dubai. Likewise, Sheila. Yeah, thank you for the... I feel like we should have met before. Probably. <laughs> 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 so, Sprinkler began as a social media management service, right? Why and how did the vision expand to include marketing, sales, now service? Mm -hmm. So... If I may, let me take a step back and, and tell you how we got started with Sprinkler. So this is my fourth sort of startup experience, if you will. And my first couple were in email marketing. Actually, the first three were in email marketing. Hmm. So back in the late 90s, early 2000, businesses were moving from, consumers moved from writing letters and using the phone to sending email. Now remember we had AOL addresses and Hotmail addresses and it was pretty exciting. And there were a few years where businesses didn't dive into using email. They were like, oh, email looks personal. You know, I'll, I'll wait and see. But then it was obvious to most people and it was obvious to me that businesses will have to start using email because that's where customers are. and. It's just a different way to communicate and, you know, there's no personal business and should embrace it. So I spent the next um, many, many, many years building uh, an email platform, which basically allowed large businesses, again, same large global companies with JP Morgan, Chase and Target and others, um, send commercial email out. So if you ever got an alert from your bank, your payment is due from Capital One or Citibank or Chase, chances are my technology sent it to you. If you got a breaking news alert from Washington Post, my technology sent that to you. So we ended up um, over the course of these companies, and I was the CTO originally, and the product guy, so ended up building the technology to uh, manage content, run a campaign, send an email, governance, automation, reporting, analytics, workflow, content management, all all of this stuff. And after we sold it in 2005, and, and I was with, uh, you know, I was the president of Epsilon Interactive, mm -hmm. um, arguably the biggest email marketing company at that time for the enterprise. And I saw all of the social media companies come about. There was Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. And as the largest commercial center at that time, I realized that email had some challenges. We didn't have permissions, so there was spam. We didn't have support for photos and videos. Um, we didn't have a, a way to differentiate the type of messages. And I looked at all of these and I said, oh my God, whether you're friending or following, you're giving someone permission. There's support for multimedia, Flickr, SlideShare, YouTube. And um, there was inbox and feed. I'm like, oh, this is gonna solve the problems I had with commercial email. And I saw consumers were embracing it, billions of people using this. And I'm like, businesses will have to start using this. That's how I got started with social media. And I started Sprinkler and built a category that is now known as social media management. But we, when we were building it, the market was very siloed. There was a lot of excitement. So we were trying to build a social management platform when the market saw us as the industry as uh, social publishing was one category, engagement was another category, uh, social advertising was a different category, and listening was a different category. Yeah. And we put it all together because we were following what our customers wanted us to do. Um, and so as a result, so because I built all of those capabilities for one channel, the way we did it that was different um, from everybody else was that we abstracted these capabilities, planning, publishing, response management, analytics, automation, workflow, um, things I had learned about large enterprise implementation, workspaces, permissioning, governance, connecting different teams, all of that was baked into version one of the architecture because that was version six or seven of my previous life. And we abstracted this out and we built a communication layer below it that could just connect to any platform and it could publish, it could engage, it could also listen. So now roll the tape to like 2015, 16, we have, by a long shot, we have the best social media management platform that industry is fairly established. 
And we had the sort of the second aha moment where we go, hey, we're listening. So we're sitting on every bit of legally available public data. So if you think about, hey, I'm Samsung, what's in my CRM system? Who bought my phone? What's in my marketing system? People who came to my website. What's in my Sprinkler database? Every person who can potentially buy Samsung. And we now can listen to what they're talking about Samsung. We can listen to what they're talking about Apple. We can listen to what they're talking about using the phone. And we started collating this insight. Around the same time, we realized, man, we can't process this without AI. Because we're not sitting on an Oracle backend like many of the CRM companies or relational database. So we built the backend for unstructured data processing. We had built a very resilient way to publish to any channel, communicate on any channel. And we had a first big aha going, God, we built the first truly omni-channel engine to communicate. Two, we've built the technology to power conversations. And with AI, that's going to be the future. And at that time, I, I distinctly remember the, the day we realized, look, w w social media is great. You, I'm running a campaign on Facebook. Let's say I'm a cable company saying, oh, we love our customers. We are the best cable company. A customer can come underneath and, and complain. No, you're not the best. I have an issue with my bill and I can't get it resolved. The poor marketer doesn't know what to do. So. It, like very shortly after founding, we had to get into customer service because otherwise you couldn't publish because people are complaining on it. But we had to get into marketing and content. So we realized that we are, we're actually quite sophisticated in customer service in digital. And in the next two, three years, we started building AI and conversation intent analysis. We're like, oh my God, I can resolve an issue 30% faster, 50% faster, 30% mm -hmm. less cost when someone's talking to me on Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. Or on Reddit or leave me a review. And we were taking these insights and we pick up the, fan that, uh, the fact that your battery is heating up and people are complaining and that's why you're getting one star reviews. So we go to the phone company and say, hey, we picked up this one star reviews, this real time insights on your customer. What do you want us to do? They're like, oh, just ask them to call 1-800-SUPPORT. I'm pissed off. You're asking me to call the contact center where you're going to put me on for hold for another 30 minutes. And we started, like, well, this is not going to work. And on the publishing side, we were publishing like thousands, tens of thousands of pieces of content. Brands like Nike were working around the world to coordinate content. So we're like, our next logical step is actually to get into the contact center take the technology we've been building for social and digital, bring it to voice. And then it's a very distinct approach. It's a pure play, architectural play. And if we can digitize all of it, the way all we have to do is convert voice to text. Right. And by the way, simultaneously, around the same time, with the rise of companies like Twilio, telephony, which was the big problem to solve in context, and this was just in getting commoditized. We're like, man, what, 13, 15 million seats are gonna move to the cloud. Everybody is kind of consolidating, changing, upgrading. That's the next logical business for us to get in. Our marketing can evolve into the CMO's dashboard. Our insights business can evolve into voice of the customer. And we're like, we're not building social media. We're actually building with the future of CRM. We're building what's going to come after Salesforce. And it will connect to Salesforce and it will, um, you know, s CRM is a system of record for transactional data. But when you think about where your customer meets your brand, that employee behind that firewall today is struggling. He doesn't know what other employees are doing in, in a different channel, in a different market, in a different business. You know, the edge of the brand is where the chaos are. That's where... That's the biggest risk. That's the biggest opportunity. And no one's paying attention to the edge. And we're like, aha, we're going to build an operating system for the edge. And that will be the future of front office. And we put our heads down and have been building um, ever since. And because we're doing too much, it was confusing to the marketplace. But now it makes sense. So bringing together sales and marketing and service mm -hmm. is a revolutionary concept it, it organizationally yeah. for enterprises. So what kind of companies are choosing 
to, to move to you and bring those together and how are they doing that? Companies who are embracing the future. In the last 15 years, the world has undeniably changed in the way it had and in a long time. And the biggest changes, whatever you call them, these new ways of communicating have connected people together. So your brand is no longer what you say it is. It is what customers say it is. Mm. And customers define a brand based on their experiences across all touch points. So you can make the best car, but if your service sucks, yeah. you're going to struggle. You can make the best phones, but if you can't provide great experiences everywhere else, it's going to affect your brand. And so it should be obvious to everyone that brand is the homogeneous synthesis of all the experiences and customers who see it in a siloed way will lose to companies, brands who see it in a siloed way will lose to companies who don't. Look at the rise of the Amazons, the Teslas, um, you know, the Googles and everybody who kind of is able to do that a little more seamlessly. So, but how do you identify that company, right? Because you're a company that wants to grow and, and yeah. take on the world, right? <laughs> uh, so how do you identify that company who's ready to look at the world in a new way? And so we don't try and sell the vision to our customers today. We have 30 odd products. Each one of it is either number one or number two or becoming number one and two in that specific space. Whether it's social media management, whether it's social customer service, digital customer service, now CCAS content management, advocacy, influencer. So every product is, is, is a leader in its own right and it's all built on this one platform. So when you start with Sprinkler, with one product, and you can start in one country, in one business unit, you begin to, to experience the sprinkler magic. What, what is the sprinkler magic? Two things. One, you begin to appreciate the power of the architecture. And you begin to understand that when I bring the second product on, boom, that snaps in. And everything I've invested in my first product now is accessible for my second. Because you always only have one instance of sprinkler. And so you begin to understand the power of this. Hey, I can have one AI model. I just brought my marketing team on. This content AI just works. Oh, I got that product AI. By the way, now I'm bringing my call center on. That product analytics and AI is picking up intent. I, I don't have to do anything. The same workflow, I can say, oh, someone's really pissed off in my contact center, suppress them from advertising. So you begin to see this network synergies because of this unification layer of services that's at the enterprise level. I'm a brand, I can set up a AI rule that goes to all countries, all agencies, and is constantly analyzing when you hit publish, whether it meets the brand tone. And if it doesn't meet it, the rule will kick it back. You know, MGM was one of our customers and when we had the unfortunate shooting in Vegas, they were able to push a button and stop advertising everywhere. Nice. Even the agencies, because it's a global rule that just immediately took effect. Those things are just not possible without this architecture. And that's, that's why that's the first part of the sprinkler magic. The second part of the sprinkler magic, um, Sheila, you've heard us say, we're trying not just to create this new category, which we call the unified the XM, we're also trying to create the world's most loved enterprise software company. That means a lot for us. So enterprise software, and nobody's fault, it's just how it's evolved, is hardcore selling. <laughs> Yeah. You know, that's the pedigree of enterprise selling. You know, you pay them a lot, salespeople a lot of money. They're trained professionals and they sell and they show up for the renewal. And that's a reputation of the industry. Kind of the sorry way things existed before Amazon. Retail, you know, you just... You transactions. Had to, it was transaction and if you wanted high-end retail experience, you paid a lot of money and getting the widest selection cheapest price and faster service and great experience was just not an option. Until, you know, Jeff and Amazon took 10, 15 years, got scale and brought that mantra to life. We are trying to bring that customer obsession to enterprise software. So 
sometimes I get asked, well, why aren't you growing fat? Why are you not adding more logos? I'm like, why is that important? I've got the biggest brands in the world, 10 of the 10 biggest brands, 80 of the top 100, 13 of the 14 banks, seven of the eight largest CPG companies in the world. And I did 310 customer meetings last year. And I met 310 happy customers. Wow. And so the power of focusing on, we're trying to do a lot. So it's important that we stay focused on the top and we solve these big, big problems with elegance and grace. And we take the approach of translating this to value for customers. You know, our biggest customers are paying us 10 to $20 million, many of them. And it's a CIO, CFO, CEO level decision. And it's not going to be on a handshake. It's not how you renew. You renew because if you pay us fifteen million dollars, we're giving you fifty million dollars of value. And there's only three ways you create value in the enterprise: increase sales, reduce cost, or manage risk. And so we map it back and we deliver. So there are a lot of you're, you're in the CCAS market now, mm -hmm. and there are lots of CCAS companies that support email and chat mm -hmm. and maybe bots. Um, and not the 30 plus channels that mm -hmm. you support. Mm -hmm. So when you walk into a company who's used to hearing that story of email and chat, how do you convince them that, you know, supporting 30 plus channels is the right answer? I don't think the problem is of convincing why that is important. You know, I, I had, I was talking to someone else earlier who said, if I'm, I go to a tailor and I make a sleeve of my shirt, I go to another tailor make my collar, <laughs> and I go to another tailor to get the buttons done, and that's how I'm used to buying shirts, I don't have to sell you the, or convince you that you really should just buy a shirt, not try and buy this and put it together. Um, the, the, the struggle, though, is admittedly people going, like, that's a lot, you can't do it. And, 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 and what happens is when you, it's just a little bit of early chicken and egg, everybody who actually gets their hands dirty, does a proper evaluation, looks at the technology, buy us. And they become happy and they tell their friends and family. Um, we, I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint wars. I don't want to big win, win big RFPs. And it's just a question of time before you know, we're in all the quadrants, the magic quadrants, and it's just a question of time, and th those things will sort itself out. We're not in a hurry. We're playing a 30-year game. So one of the things that I'm, I'm hearing is that a lot of your CCAS customers are, for, are, are existing customers. They're existing mm -hmm. social customers. Mm -hmm. So how does an existing sprinkler social customer become a sprinkler service customer? Uh, by being super happy with... Uh, how, well, they experience the sprinkler magic. <laughs> and the two things, you know, they use this for social media, they understand we're enterprise grade, we're for real, but they trust us, and then they realize, well, if I'm able to resolve an issue with sprinkler on through a modern channel for 50% of the cost, and I'm able to resolve it 50% faster, and my customer is 50% happier, why can't I do it to my voice contact center, which is where my bulk of my agents are? So it's a logical step. And so we're seeing a lot of these customers who have experienced us have very little resistance in bringing it to the contact center because we're just adding one more channel. Right, but that's what you're doing. But for them, it's typically different pieces of the business, different decision makers. Correct. So how do, how do you create that path? Or did the, does the customer help you create that path? How do you find out where the need is on the service side? And we were not able to do this even a year ago, but now we are super comfortable doing proof of concepts and pilots and showing you that this is real. And let's not spend six months with an RFP and a PowerPoint uh, battle. Let's take a thousand agents or a hundred agents and pick one of your contact centers and let me show you how to do it and or move hundred agents in a, in a contact center and just turn on voice and we'll show you how it works and what the results are and then you make a decision. And so this idea of let's, we want you to be convinced and not on paper but in reality is working very well for us. So I did a session at Enterprise Connect this year mm -hmm. and uh, the topic was what comes after CCAS? Mm -hmm. And I had that question answered by um, the head of CX1 at NICE mm -hmm. and the head of Genesis 
Cloud CX and the head of contact center at Salesforce. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you that question. Mm -hmm. What comes after CCAS? Um, how, how does the market start moving toward what they need to come together after CCAS? Well, after two days, the answer should be obvious, <laughs> at least in my mind. What comes after CCAS is unified customer experience management. What is unified customer experience management? The ability for you to manage the experiences of anybody who touches your brand. That's your contact center. That's also an advertisement. That's also a survey you run. That's also a marketing message that you sent out. That's also the in-store experience. That's also the in-branch experience if you're a bank. Uh, that's an investment advisor or a salesperson experience. What comes after the siloed, I mean, first you unify CCAS, because CCAS itself is like, 10 siloed solutions now, we put it together, that's beautiful. What comes after that is the ability to convert your 10,000 agents from complaint resolvers, noise dealers, to make them your digital storefront. If you walk into an Apple store, which you know other brands are now have their stores as well, I walk in with an iPhone 10 and say, oh, my phone's slow. You know, Phil's going to look at it and say, let me run some diagnostic. Yeah, you know, you don't have enough battery, you got too many apps. I suggest you upgrade to an iPhone 14. And he walks over, hey, Jake, just, uh, you know, show Sheila the iPhone 14. And you go, look, do you have any deals on it? Am I upgrade for, eligible for an upgrade? And Jake comes over and says, yeah, sure, let me look you up. It's a seamless experience for you. Why the hell can we not do that in digital, Sheila? Why the hell did we take beautiful channels like digital, where you're doing bi-directional conversations, and take it back to the way the world was 40 years ago in CCAS? That's because the contact center has no visibility about sales yeah. campaigns or marketing content. The contact centers have no visibility across product lines and markets. And it's about time we start looking at it with a fresh set of eyes. And if you tell me that's not what's coming after CCAS, I don't know what else is. Now, I understand why it's not in the interest of someone who is a CCAS provider to say that anything else is. That's perspective. I don't buy that. I think this is what's going to come after CRM. Took us the first 10 years to get the foundation right. It's going to take us with year three into a second decade of getting all the the app interfaces, right? The contact agent, the sales, the marketing. And then we'll see. It's a, we think of this as a marathon. There's no need to sprint right now. Thank you very much. Thank it was you a very great much. Conversation. Thank you. Appreciate it.